developing states and states in transition. In 2005, Professor Scharf um, and the PILPG were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by six governments and a prosecutor of an international criminal tribunal for the work they've done to help in the prosecution of major war criminals. Professor Scharf also served as a member of the international team of experts that provided training to the judges of the Iraqi High Tribunal and led the first training session for the investigative judges and prosecutors of the Cambodia Tribunal. In 2002, Professor Scharf established the War Crimes Research Office at Case Western Reserve University here, and which provides research assistance to international tribunals. He's also the co-director of the Summer Institute for Global Justice. Professor Scharf has previously served in the Office of Legal Advisor to the U.S. Department of State, has published voluminously over the years, and he's here to introduce Judge Rod for today's program. Thank you, Professor Scharf. The, the only really relevant thing is that in, as, as Jacqueline mentioned, um, in my capacity as one of the people that were asked to help train the judges of the Iraqi High Tribunal uh, in 2004, I met a young judge who was one of the few that could speak absolutely um, perfect English, and he was sort of the star of the group. And that judge ended up being um, elevated to being the chief investigative judge of the Iraqi High Tribunal. He was the one who was picked the first time Saddam Hussein was brought into court on world TV to do the arraignment. And then he later was the one who did all the investigations for the Anfal campaign trial, which was the biggest of all the trials. Um, that individual, of course, is the speaker today. And before I introduce him, I want to read an excerpt from my book about him that sort of uh, gives you the essence of this person. Um, for those of you who are second years that took international law, you all have read this book, but if you're a first year, um, I'm not assigning this this spring. Um, and if you do want a copy of the book, I have flyers, you can always pick one up. Okay, so this is from the arraignment, the chapter. And I have to tell you, I do a, an impersonation of Saddam Hussein, which sounds a lot like the one from Saturday Night Live. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize to any relatives of Saddam for... <laughs> for any of, of the characterizations here. All right. Um, flanked by two Iraqi prison guards and four Iraqi policemen, Saddam was ushered into the small courtroom in handcuffs and with a chain around his wrist. Dressed in a dark suit, polished brown shoes, and a crisp white shirt buttoned to the collar, Saddam sported stylishly coiffed hair and a neatly trimmed beard that was a far cry from his scraggly Ted Kaczynski Unabomber look at the time of his capture in December 2003. The Arab world had never seen anything like this scene, which was broadcast repeatedly over the next 24 hours. In a region of the world accustomed to tyrants and despots, a seemingly invincible dictator was hauled before a court of his own citizens. The television broadcasts of the event showed only the back of the judge's head, and his name at the time was not mentioned for security reasons. But a few months later, the world would learn that the man who read Saddam Hussein his rights and summarized the charges on that July day in Baghdad was 35-year-old Rod Julie. Built like a football player, the youthful judge was a graduate of Baghdad Law School. He was originally one of the investigative judges of the Central Criminal Court of Iraq, Iraq's newly established criminal court for ordinary crimes. Judge Rod had come to the attention of American authorities in 2003 while serving in Ajaf when he courageously signed an indictment for the notorious Shiite warlord Muqtada al-Sadr, charging him with murder. The public revelation of the Muqtada al-Sadr indictment placed the young judge and his entire family in great danger, and they were relocated for their protection to the international zone in Baghdad, where they resided until the end of the Dujal trial. Because of his solid command of English and his unflappable demeanor, Rod Juhi became an obvious choice to head the investigative phase. When the authors asked him why he agreed to serve as the investigative judge for such a sensational, challenging, and dangerous case, Judge Rod answered simply, this is my job, my responsibility, my duty to society. He added, many Iraqi people thought that there was no law, no rules, no order, and we wanted to bring the rule of law and justice back to Iraq. In response to the follow-up question of how it felt to be face-to-face -face with one of the world's most ruthless dictators, Judge Rod merely shrugged his shoulders and said, I just tried to think of him as an ordinary criminal defendant. The guards removed Saddam's handcuffs and gently guided him into the chair across from Judge Rod, who sat behind a table. 
The dictator and the judge faced each other about eight feet apart with a low railing separating them. The first moments were palpably tense. Saddam, who apparently thought he was about to be summarily executed, was visibly anxious. But in a preview of things to come in the later trial, during the 26-minute session, Saddam went from being nervous and hesitant to being confrontational and belligerent, while at the same time displaying legal acumen and even a sense of humor. Answering the judge's request to state his name for the record, Saddam said, and here's the, C the uh, Saturday Night Live part, I am Saddam Hussein, the president of Iraq. Does that sound like him a little bit? I don't know. <laughs> Former president of Iraq, Judge Rahid uh, corrected, to which Saddam insisted, no, present, current, it is the will of the people. As the hearing got underway, Saddam began to challenge Judge Rod, asking who he was and under what authority he was holding the hearing. Judge Rod proceeded to explain that the tribunal that would be trying Saddam had been set up under the U.S. occupation. So you are representing the coalition, Saddam asked. No, the young jurist replied, without showing emotion or raising his voice, I am an Iraqi representing the Iraqi judicial system. I'll, I'll leave the rest out because we want to get to the main event. But I think this sets the stage for what is going to be a really spectacular speech. We are very happy to have Judge Rod as our first ever Cox Center visiting jurist. And we thank the International Law Society, the Cox Center, and the dean who's here with us today for making his visit here possible and this speech possible. Judge Rod. Thank you very much for a nice introduction. And uh, really, you have nice uh, characters. <laughs> Dean, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your uh, coming here. Today, is, uh, we like to talk about, a little bit about the challenges of Saddam Hussein trial. Uh, and also, I like to put this trial not as an academic or judicial way, but I like to put it in a practical way. How what, what are you going to face when you are working in the international field? And before that, I like to give some background about the rule of law in Iraq so you can think why the Iraqi tribunal is very important for Iraqi people. Last 50 years in Iraq, it's, uh, especially in 1958, uh, that's the first call, military call in Iraq. And before that, Iraq was monarchy. And it's July 14th, 1958, the COP is coming. At the same day, the king of his family executed in Iraq without a trial. Then the, uh, the government, the military government, established new courts called Al-Mahdawi Court. This court take position to prosecute all the leaders. But who is the head of Al-Mahdawi Court? The, the head of the Mahdawi Court is military person, the cousin of the uh, leader of the uh, court. So al-Mahdawi, or Abbas al-Mahdawi, or he took the position to endorse and represent the new government. Five years later, next call happened in Iraq, 1963. And same thing happened after one hour from the military coup, which is the first bad coup, the Prime Minister, Abdel Karim Qasim, assassinated or executed without a trial. Not just that, they, the, occupy, the, uh, uh, the military people put his body in bag and they throw it in the river in Iraq. So Abdel Karim Qasim has no grave in Iraq. So he prosecuted and executed maybe in less than one hour. 1968, the Ba'ath party come with a new uh, cop again, and Saddam's come to the power as a second person, not as a first person. And in 1978, 79 exactly, Saddam became the president of Iraq. Then he took as a first person in, in Iraq there. Then they established the Revolution Court, which is known very well in Baghdad. And one year later, they start the war with Iran. And during this war, 
Iraq lost around a million of people. But the most important during this war, we have the crime in Dijel, and we have the Anfal crimes also. In 1988, the Saddam's regime attacked the Kurdish population north of Iraq, and they killed around 180,000 civilian people from Kurd. And then in 1991, after the, uh, we called here the Wolf, Go uh, Wolf, uh, Gulf War, uh, or we called the first Wolf War, but in Iraq we called the second Wolf, uh, Gulf War, sorry, because the first Gulf War with Iran from 1980 until 1988. So in 1991, uh, after Shia's uprising, also Saddam's regime killed around 300,000 person or individual in Iraq, including uh, children, female, male, and without any reason except they represent their right to change the regime. After 2003, after the occupation and the ex-regime is gone, legal issues become very, very big you know, things in Iraq. Most of Iraqis people, when we talk about the legal expert or Iraqi people about the law or rule of law, they will talk about the Code of Hammurabi, how is, how is it important for Iraqi people. You know, 3,000 years ago, Iraqis wrote the first code in the nations, which is 280 articles on a stone. By the way, the original code is in, in, in France, not in Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> and explain the rule of law and the right of each person. So when you talk with Iraqis people, they talk about the Hammurabi. How is it important? 2003 is turning point. Most of the legal people, legal experts think, okay, said, this is our time to build and bring rule of law back in Iraq. So why Iraq High Tribunal? People look at the 50 years ago, how the king and his family you know, executed without reason, just because he's a king. You know? There is another, you know, another cop in, in, in Egypt, but no one executed the king in Egypt. But in Iraq, it's different. Anyway, Iraq High Tribunal, established to bring Saddam and his leaders to the justice. However, it's not easy to work over 35 years and to restore the rule of law there. We're going to talk about 35 years in the regime, how the regime, ex-regime or Ba'ath regime, systematically control and commits crime inside Iraq. This lecture, frankly, about the challenges, just the challenges. You know, I'm not going to analyze each piece of point academically or according to the theory of the judicial, Iraqi judicial way. I just want to point some important events in this. The first challenge is the legal issues. Is there any Legitimacy for the court, if the court established under the you know, occupation power. He said maybe the occupier or CPA has a right to establish the court because the Security Council gave them a resolution number 1483. But this is still <coughs> legal expert not satisfied. So how to go around after the uh, CPA time is done, Iraqi parliament established, people, the representative at, uh, elected by the Iraqi people. So immediately, we run to rewrite a new law and pass a new law from the uh, Iraqi parliament under number 10, 2005, which is, gave the more legitimacy to the Iraqi High Tribunal to start prosecution, the Ba'ath uh, ex-member in Ba'ath regime. 
And also the jurisdiction of the court, it's four kinds of crimes. Genocide, war crime, crime against humanity, and as well as some violation under Iraqi law. We are talking here about the financial issues because a lot of money you know, disappeared from 1986 until 2003. This is a legal question. I'm not going to cover it a lot because I know Professor Sharf and other members, they talk about it. Because we have limited time here, I'm going to run a little bit to the technical problem in this uh, court. Technical problem, the first one, we're talking about the complaints. I, as I said, 35 years, and we have the jail crime. Let's say this from the beginning. 1979, the first day when Saddam took position as a president, he bring all the Ba'ath members in meeting, and he said, I will announce some names. Each one, I announce his name, he has to stand up. And he announced most of the Ba'ath leader in that time. It's around 25 person. And these people disappear within one week. No one knows about them. <coughs> Not just that. His cousin, Ali Hassan al-Majid, during that meeting said, you know, Mr. President, these people all agent, and we have to execute them. But the head of these guys, he did not come with us because he's in the prison right now, in jail. We have to execute him also. So they execute someone. He remained in jail for 10 years before the uh, Saddam's took position. When we started the investigation, we did not find anything about this group of people. No evidence, no, except the families. And to ask the families, they said, we have no idea about our members. From 1979 until now, 2004, we have no idea about them. This is the first one. Second one, the jail, the Anfal. I'm talking about, the Anfal, I'm talking about 180,000 person got killed. Children, men, women. And this is Troy, around 2,500 villages. No reason. Just because they are living in the north region of Iraq and the regime has strategy against them. 1991. 300,000 Iraqi from south got killed by the mass graves. Same thing. So you think how many people will have to interview? 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million? You know, because each one of them has family. But sometimes all family disappear. Because they took all the family together and they killed them together. We, we come up with strategy. Because my position, as uh, Professor Sharf mentioned, Chief Investigative Judge, I have to run all this. You know, the interview, hearing, document, Massey Graves, and dealing with all this problem. We decide to open a branch of offices, south, north, and mid, and the main office, at least, and send our teams, each office has several judges there and several investigators and legal assistant, a paralegal, and what they need to interview as much as they could distinguish people, witnesses and victims. But we face this problem. Iraq speaks three languages, Arabic, Kurdish, and Turkmen. When we talk about Arabic, it's not a big deal, because most of the population in Iraq speak Arabic. But when we talk about the Kurdish, it's a huge problem, because there is local dialect. No one can understand it. If I talk about Suleimania, people in Erbil speak differently from Suleimani. They're both Kurdish. So we have to hire some very accurate translators. By the way, translation, people who work in the international field, translation, one of the biggest problems. I can give you one example. 
One day, I was uh, hearing one accused, and I gave him his right. I said, you have a right to remain silent. And the translator, that time, this is 2000, late 2004. And the translator, sitting next to one of our advisors, he's American, I say, and he said, the judge told to the accused, you are shut up. <laughs> I said, you are from which country? <laughs> he said, Morocco. I said, go out. <laughs> I said, you cannot understand Iraqi dialect. You know? So translation, it's very important. We have to hire people who were raised in this village and graduate from the school and he able to speak Arabic and, English and Kurdish accurately. So the judge can understand both dialects. At the same time, we have to hire female judges and prosecutors because there's a lot of rape crimes there. And according to the, our traditional, and many countries traditional, females cannot talk with male about the rape crimes. So this one, just one small problem. Number of documents, 35 years. We are talking about the genocide, war crime, crimes against humanity. How to deal with this document? And how much document do you think we have? Million? Two million? Four million? <laughs> 21 tons of document, guys. How to work with 21 tons of document? The head of the documents department came to my office and said, Chief, the first collection we have is 21 tons of documents. Mm -hmm. And I need something to, to protect this document. I said, OK, you got it. We have partner in our mission called the Jimmy Crime Liaison Office, RCLO. And we had meetings said, we have this document. And this is the first collection. By the way, you know, there is a lot of collection after that. I said, we have to find a place to put all these documents together. And we have to come up with a plan to read 21 tons of documents. I have 24 judges, investigative judges, working with, for me. And also, I have 60 investigators, 100 paralegal assistant, and some other stuff. After a while, we said, OK, this is the plan. We built a unit we called you know, SUE, Security Events Unit, which is far away from the court building, very far. And we hired 100 individuals. And we divided them groups. The first group is 25 person. They have no job, except they open the box and look to the document. This is white paper. This is paper with something. I have no idea. Put it here, throw this in the trash. Second to group, also 25. They read the paper. They look if this some orders or some administrative staff or legal staff. Put legal staff different area and push out the other administrative staff. Third group. 25 also. This is a group, it's different. We have cases. So the third, third group has to read carefully and know this page connect with which, which case. And put it separately, depend on cases. And the final group, we have electronic facility. They have to make a scanning and put this document in, the, in our data. This is a one session. Second session is all the investigative judges, prosecutors, investigators, uh, legal assistant has an access for this document. And they have to read it 
through their computers. The problem, we don't have computer in Iraq until 2003, 2000. And we don't have internet in Iraq until 2004. So we have to teach our staff and judges how to use this machine. <laughs> and gave them at least simple way how to access to their cases. Each two or three judges working in one case with their staff. So they can check their case accurately and pick which is the most important document in this case or that case. We face another problem. We are working in the midst of the civil war. I'm talking about 2004, 2005. So a lot of <coughs> crisis there. How to protect this document? If someone sent rock to this building, or someone figure out about the building when we keep our document. When we pick each document, and we think this is a very important document, we make four copies. And Professor Schaaf loved this story. <laughs> we make four copies. And we have to keep each copy in different place. And no one knows about this copy except around four or five people. The judge himself working in this case, prosecutor working with him, investigator, and the chief investigative judge. Just four or five people know exactly where is these cabbies <coughs> located. In case someone fired or attacked or steal, we have another cabbies. And it's happened. And it happened, you know. People know, figure out about one place and they attack that place and burn it. And my deputy called me and said, Sir, the place we keep our documents burn. He said, don't worry, we have five others. <laughs> <coughs> this way, we deal with the document. Documents lead us to another issue, massive graves. I'm sorry I'm going to show you something about the massive grave. If you feel uncomfortable, just let me know. I can, can go, you know, run quick from this. Massive grave, it's also one of the biggest concerning in Iraq. How many massive graves in Iraq? And how we know is exactly this massive graves related to the crimes, not to the war. Because we have eight years war with Iran and several months war in the, with Kuwaiti's border. People in my mass grave department connect with the RCLO, international organization, and come up with number of mass graves. And they told me we have, in the first report, 250 mass grave location. This is the Iraqis map. I told them, look, avoid each place near to the Iranian and Kuwaiti's border. So we avoid the south and all this place. Because the defense council will say, OK, this is war people, war victims. And go to the west area. Make your report on the west area. And tell me about that. Then, after a while, when we read the documents and we get the accurate information about, for example, al Anfal crimes, we found documents about where is the mass graves, some in north, some in south, near to the Saudi border, some near to the Syrian border. And we decided to pick these places. This area is desert. How to go there and open the grave and took the bodies 
and do your job accurately in desert. We have to build camp in this area. We have to build places for sleeping, places for working, places for eating, places for meeting, and also we have to put electronic staff, security, and connection, and transportation. When we talk about the electricity, for example, we have to put generators <coughs> and gas to let the electricity run 24 hours. <coughs> when we talk about the communication, we have to build satellites and internet and connect people in the desert with people in the in cities. So it's not easy. Then we have to hire international expert because Iraqi uh, government, Minister of Interior, Minister of Human Rights, has no ability to work in this area alone. So we hired some international expert to work in Kosovo and these places. The most important also security. We have to build a lot of security there because we cannot, you know, put army in this area. And we are worried if someone knows about this field so they can attack them and kidnapping them. So we built a huge military operation in the desert. Then we pick which place we have to open. Uh, sorry, I cannot give another more pictures and open because the security reason for, because most of the pictures with faces for people working there. And for security reason, we cannot show the faces of people. We open the grave, and we look. <coughs> this grave is female, male, children. Because the regime is divided, people, in groups. Children, male, female. For investigative, or investigation, or prosecution favor, I pick most of female and children and open it. So I can avoid, as much as I could, the defense counsel said, okay, this is people killed in war. So I pick females and children. When we open, we go step by step. The first, we open the grave and work in this area. Then we go to the evidence, each one exactly. Because this leads us sometimes to some eyewitnesses, because some people survived and did not kill in the massive graves. So like this, we took the wash and then we go more accurate if there is anything. You see that there is bag here. So we get IDs sometimes in the massive graves also. Each body, we have teamwork on it and took it out. Then we put this body in bag and ship it to our lab by the helicopter. And our lab, we put in security place in Baghdad to analyze and make, make uh, exact report. For example, I show you, you know, this is from the beginning. And now we took just the head or, you know, then we analyze it. Yeah. This is the final, <coughs> you know, final uh, picture for each body. And I'm talking about 250 location, each location has between 10 to 15 grave. Each grave has between 80 to 100 body. And with all this facilities, with all this transportation, generators, gas, electricity, uh, helicopters, all this operation, then the report come this, said, okay, this is skeleton or this human remains has four shots and the shots come from the chest area or which is whatever area and gave us the claws with the skeleton and the report. Mm -hmm. So we can use it in our, uh, as evidence. I don't know if you can see it or not, in the middle of this 
skeleton. There is something to wear here. It's not a clear. Here is a clear. This is ID. This is the ID. This is Iraqi ID. Sometimes we found some like this. This is very grateful for the, our job because we took this ID and we know, according to the official record, where is the address of this, player, this person. So we can go to, the, to their family or their relative and interview them. I pick this because this is an interesting story. This is ID for lady now. She's, around, she's a young lady right now. But 1988, she was a child around six years old. And the regime arrested all her family. And she disappeared between the mountains in that time. When I sent this picture to my team in North, after three days, they called me and said, Judge, this is still life. And I told to Kiho, we have one life. said, oh my god. <laughs> we went to Kurdistan and to interview her. And she told us a very sad story. How the regime arrested all her family. And she was by her, you know, she, uh, by her, with her friend in the farm. And when she looked when she looked back, she found the military around her village and they took all the family. And she cannot go there. So this so she decided within six years, you know, just think, six years person, you know, just young or baby or what do you think? To s live between the mountains alone. Several several years later she became a member from other family. Not just that. When we interview them, sometimes we had a lot of motion pressure in this area. Because when we interview one lady, we told her, OK, tell us about your story or why you have case against Saddam's regime. And she told us about her story for na when the regimes attacked the village and she left the village with her four or five babies. Because she has to run between the mountains, so she has to use donkeys or horse with her and put her babies on donkey or the horse. And during her way, one of her babies fall down the valley, so has to make decision one second. Pick the baby or continue. Because if she go to pick the baby, she will spend 15 minutes to go to the valley and pick the baby. And there is no guarantee when she back, she will find other children. So in one second, she make decision, she has to leave the baby and continue with other children. Because it has two choices, either four or one. If she stay with the four, she will leave one. And the one will die in front of her. And if she go to bring the one, maybe there is no guarantee for other four. So a lot of story like that. People working in international field will hear a lot of story like this. So we have to stop sometime the investigation session because the motion issue is common, and we don't like to let the motion feeling, you know, affect our job. So we stop a lot of sessions. So I said, okay, we stop today, come tomorrow, so we can continue. This also kind of challenge when we did our job there. Funding, it's really important because without money we cannot do anything. When we talk about the massive grave, each grave we pick, we spend between five to seven millions. And we picked seven, seven places, yeah. So seven by seven, and you have to calculate that. So funding is very important. That's one, one part. Second part, document. Third, 
part, we need to build courtroom very strong because we understand and we expect the courtroom will attack by the you know insurgency or terrorist or bad supporter, whatever. So we I decide with some friends to pick this building. This is the headquarters for the Ba'ath regime before. Saddam built it as the strongest building in Iraq. If any Iraq attack this building like egg, when you throw the egg, that's it. The wall of this building is two meters. I can't say this now because there is no problem, because we are concluded right now. <laughs> it's two meters wide. And between the front and inside the wall, there is steel. So if any rock or anything happen, doesn't mean anything. And we pick this for, not as a, because as a headquarter for the Ba'ath regime, no, because it's the strongest building we can protect ourselves inside. And this is the, the front, uh, area. Iraqi's government put 90 million US dollars and US put in the beginning 70 million but then they put a lot of money also it's almost more than 100 million I don't know exactly the number but I know of Iraqi's number it's around 90 millions to build this facility and work with this operation. We have some time, yeah. This is inside. Dealing. We're almost here. This is the last. When we work with the, this kind of crime, we have to deal with the defendant, political pressure, and social and security. So there is a lot of pressures. People talk about the Iraqi tribunal and criticizes from outside because they compare the court with the international standard. I don't know if they, when they talk about that, they read the pressure in Iraq and how the Iraqi judges work there. So we have to deal with very, very professional defendants and we have to figure your way to investigate them and make your case strong. How to deal with leader of Iraq for 35 years. You have to come up with a plan to make this person talk. The first challenge I faced with Saddam when I interviewed him the first time, I was thinking, is he going to talk or abuse the court? I said, I'm not going to talk. So as a judge, I have to come with something legal, 100 person, but as, at the same time, let the accused talk. And this is not, we cannot find this in any article in law because this is kind of social issues. So it's not easy to deal with kind of this person. One of our strategy to let him talk. Through general question, let him talk, 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 and throw some question in the middle. <coughs> And he, when he's talk about himself as a hero, as a cat, you know, when, so, okay, you are said, you are a hero. Why you did not talk about your responsibility in this or that? He will continue because part of his traditional, he cannot give up in the middle of his you know, speech. But we have to spend four hours sometimes to get 30 second question. So, yeah, and you have to decide where exactly you have to send your question. Because sometimes, I remember when Saddam talked about when he arrested 1963, he said, I'm the, I'm the responsible guy for everything. Ahmed Hassan al Bakri has no responsibility. And in this minute, I said, okay, why are you not talking about the Dijal? 1963, you said, you told to the court, you are, not, you are responsible for everything. Why you, now you said, you are not responsible? I said, no, I'm responsible. I'm the guy who makes the decision. I'm the guy who makes the order. I'm the guy that, 
and he's continued. But I have to wait three hours, four hours sometimes before I treat this question. So this kind of strategy, people with prosecution or investigation, has to be very, very patient, you know? <laughs> and expect everything, signature or something like that. Uh, the trial, same thing. And we have to expect in the trial, in Saddam, he will, he will love media and he will talk to the media. This is the courtroom from inside. And uh, our traditional jurisdiction is different than the US. So the judges, their clerk in the front, cues in front of them, defense counsel that way, prosecution, prosecutor this way, and visitor at, behind the screen. Uh, there's some pictures disappear here. <laughs> anyway, yeah, some pictures disappear here. It's, uh, there is another pressure, security. Frankly, I put a picture for the defense counsel when he assassinated in the midst of our court. And this is one of the biggest uh, critici criticism we got from these issues. But at the same time, we have judges also assassinated. And we have prosecutor, no, we have brothers of a prosecutor assassinated. And we have a lot of staff assassinated. But we cannot, you know, publish this information. We don't like to put people in more pressure or people think if someone die, we'll stop our mission. No. We decided to build the rule of law in Iraq. We decided to restore the justice in Iraq and make Iraqi High Tribunal as a turning point in the Iraqi justice. We decided to bring Hammurabi's back to Baghdad and we decided to move forward in this case to let Iraqi people see what the rule of law means in the future. We don't like to kill the king in one second or 36, 30 seconds and, or through the body of the prime minister to the river. No. We follow the law. We follow Iraqi law and gave right for the victims to represent themselves and defend their case and we gave right for the defense, for defendant to defend themselves also, come up with their witnesses, and we come up in the end with a decision. Our verdict sometimes, we gave death penalty, and there's a lot of people released because there is no enough evidence. I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there's any questions. If there's any question, I'd be more than happy. Yes? At any point where you were my, it's, it's, it's being, my <laughs> Hi. At any point were you in fear of your life, and then what precautions did you have to take? <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, in high school, we have five questions sometimes, <laughs> you know? And we do exam. And usually, when they give us five questions, one question is not required. And we have to skip it, you know? <laughs> We, we like to restore the Iraqi justice in Iraq. And we understand we will pay tax for this and we'll pay price for this. But we have to compare your duty, your responsibility, and your you know, personal issues. If you put your personal in the beginning, you are not, not judge. You have to leave your punch. When you pick your position as a judge, you have to understand there is a lot of difficulties in front of you, whatever. You are a judge, you make decision. Judges in Italy, in Italy, they face the same threat with mafia, but they did their job. And here also, we have many stories about the judges in the US. No, this is mission, we have to continue. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, we're... <laughs> um, well, I've got two questions. Uh, First, during the, uh, in the judge's chamber, um, there was something written in Arabic at the, on the back wall, and I was curious as to what that said. If you judge someone, you have to do it justice. Okay. 
This is came from the Holy Quran. Okay. Yeah. And then second, uh, what are your plans for the future, considering your safety issues and um, your family and, and such? Um, this is maybe a more personal question, but it's okay, you know. <laughs> I know this is yeah, absolutely, it's a different way. <laughs> By the way, when Professor Sharf introduced me, he said, I issued arrest warrant against Muqtada al-Sadr before this case. And I will add something. I, will, I arrested several people from Al-Qaeda or from Baghdad. You know, because I, in, in CCCI, Central Criminal Court of Iraq, I was the judge handling the terrorist folders in Iraq. Safety, we have believed in God, frankly. In, 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 Safety, it's no one knows. Do your best and live your life. That's it. And do your, do, do your mission. That's it. You have responsibility and continue. But do your best. Don't be easy target for bad people. I cannot give you any guarantee for my life. <laughs> You have right to pick. <laughs> Ladies first, huh? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm just wondering what you plan to do with your LLM degree. Are you going to return to Iraq, or are you going to um, practice elsewhere? First, I want to thank you, Case Western, to give me this opportunity to study LLM. I'm focused in international area also. I have, you know, I have dream especially right now with international criminal law and humanitarian law, human rights law, to rebuild justice over all nations, because this is very important right now. Last 50 years or 60 years, a lot of a crisis happened in different, <coughs> German, Iraq, any place, many places, Cambodia, you know, Sierra Leone, Yugoslavia. So it's good to build rule of law. I have faith to be one, one piece of member in this community. That's one. Second, I still have my position in Iraq as a judge. And I'm, sabbatic. I'm in sabbatic right now. Maybe I can say it, and my court say it right now, you're still chief investigative judge in the Iraqi High Tribunal. So I, when I finish, I will return to continue, and I hope we can do my mission there. Then maybe I will switch to the international area. Yeah. George. So many questions, I don't know where to begin. Uh, <laughs> the subject has come up. Pick one. <laughs> uh, can you give me two? One, hopefully, oh, okay. just one. Uh, first one uh, many international lawyers joined Saddam's defense, defense team, hoping to give some sort of, uh, some sort of, am I, am I, legitimacy to the operation. Mm -hmm. Uh, given they weren't Iraqi lawyers, how effective were they? Uh, did they help? Did they hamper? How did they do? And third one, how do you feel about the execution video of Saddam Hussein being eventually released? Yeah. Uh, frankly, the, for the first question, we had hope in that time the defense counsel will argue the court in most legal point, not pick the politics speech or do boycott, because nothing in the law is called the defense counsel will boycott. You have responsibility to defend and give legal advice for your uh, client. So we disappoint from this point, because most of the international and national lawyer pick to choose political speech in court and focus on the legitimacy more than the legal issues. However, the courts very, you know, that very good job, hire international expert to help defense counsel. He's independent, he's not Iraqi, he's hired from the different country, and he had very good experience, has very good experience, sorry, in international cases, and he was the advisor for the defense counsel. Because we really, really want to build the uh, new justice there. So 
I think personally, this is my personal opinion, some international lawyers does good job, but some is not. Because they did not use their knowledge in legal way. The second thing, the execution, you have to keep in mind the execution under the executive authority power, not under the court power. So we have our comment in this, but this is not our responsibility, it's government responsibility. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, first of all, congratulations on the great job you did in Iraq and uh, already stayed on the floor again there. Uh, my question is, was there a debate on whether to trial Saddam in Iraq or take him to the International Criminal Court? Okay. No, it's um, International Criminal Court or ICC has a jurisdiction over a crime after 2002. That's first. Most of the crimes in Iraq, it's before 2002. That's one. Second, Iraq is not member of the ICC. That's the third. Security Council did not do anything in this area. So there is no jurisdiction for the ICC over this case. That's the first picture. Second picture, all the crimes happen in Iraq, and because there is no jurisdiction in the international court, criminal court, so the Iraqis took their position to restore the justice there. Yeah. I think we're out of time. So yeah, sorry, we ran out of time. <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming. Judge Rod will be around all year long so you can continue this dialogue. He's very open. You'll see him in the halls, and you can ask him any questions you want. Thank you all.